Hello, hope everybody's doing good. So I'm coming up to day six of Bray Sheet. And um, I mean, I, I really, I think as anybody would know, or anybody who's read the Bible would admit to, we could actually honestly come up with millions of hours on the subject matter of creation. And you still wouldn't touch it. You still would not even come close, not a drop in the ocean to what's actually happening in creation. And I think even the scientists agree to that, that we really don't know anything. You know, I mean, Stephen Hawkins who passed away. He was considered one of the greatest modern scientists wrote a book about the first five minutes of the Big Bang, you know, and it was hundreds and hundreds of pages long. And he was considered like one of the foremost, you know, scientific minds of the 20th uh, century. And in the rabbinical world, it's ain't so, you know, like. So, I mean, you're probably thinking like, well, you know, what do you have to say about it, Daniel? I mean, I, I actually also have a lot to say. I mean, that to sound conceited, but I did write a book about the whole safer brace sheet that was 95 pages and I don't know where it is anymore. But um, I wrote that back in like 2000, year 2000, about 20 years ago, 21 years ago. And I still have so much more to say. And we read it every year. We read Bray Sheet every year. We read every year. We read every book of the Bible every year. Parsha by Parsha, you know, section by section. And then every year we finish and we start again. So for thousands of years, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how long this tradition has been going on, but the Talmud even mentions that you read it on a yearly cycle. And also there's a tradition you read it uh, every three years, which is, I believe, in the conservative movement uh, and in other streams of Judaism. They don't finish it once a year. They finish it uh in three years once every three years but either way you never finish because as soon as you finish you start again and a lot of times we're reading the same commentaries you know like Onkelos and rashi and uh who lived in the 1100s uh, 1000s 11th century and then you read uh some people read nachmanides who also lived in the same time period in spain and then there's uh, ibn ezra and there's uh i mean i think just Commentaries on, on, the, on the tour, there's probably thousands of different rabbis who have made Parsha commentaries that are relatively famous in the Jewish world and the, especially in the Dati Jewish world that people, uh, you know, read and respect. Uh, I'm just mentioning two or three. I mean, there's so many more. I mean, I'm, I don't want to leave anybody out. And I've read of many, I've read many of the commentaries translated into English, of course. Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch had a massive commentary, which was he originally wrote it in German. And then eventually got translated to English. And I've read everything, all the, anybody I'm mentioning, I've read the English translations and say, oh, you're just reading the translations. But even when you're reading in Hebrew, even if you're reading the, the, the Torah itself, you're reading a translation and you still need the Masora and you still need to understand like, like when you get the actual Torah itself and you're up at the getting Aliyah, it doesn't have the Nikudot in it, it doesn't have the vowel signs and, and it doesn't have the musical notes, which is called the cantillation or the trope. And all those things have to be taught to you. So, I mean, even, even a regular, even a, let's say an Israeli or a, somebody learning Torah always needs somebody to teach him or her how to read the Torah. Even if you know the Aleph base, you know the basic letters of the Hebrew language, you need to know, uh, you need to know about the valation, about the, the, about the uh, vowels, because, you know, you have this word called who, and sometimes it's he, which is him or her. Sometimes the Torah is talking about a male, and sometimes it's talking about a female, but it's spelled the same in Hebrew. And the only way you can know if it's he or her, he, uh, him or her, like a male or female, uh, is through is through the, the the context of the sentence, and of course through the uh, Masora that tells you. Uh, and that, that's just one extreme teeny example of when to know, uh, you know, what's going on. Of course, where you're supposed to start and stop the parshas, uh, where you're supposed to start and stop the aliyahs, because there's supposed to be seven aliyahs, and then there's maftir, which is like a basically a repetition. Of the last few lines, and and, and 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 I believe in every stream of Judaism, they have you know they have these seven aliyahs. They have this idea of, of getting called up to read the Torah, and then there's usually two people standing next to the person reading. So you always have sort of like this idea that it's sort of like a base din because in the base din you need at least two people, uh, and you're in, and so the third person is the one who's reading. And so for some cases in the base din you need three people. So there's always usually any time you're reading the Bible let's say officially or like a part of the religious ceremony, you need at least three people. And it's preferable to have 10 people to have a minion because then you can say Kaddish um, and you could do other things. Uh, you know, I think though you could do a tour reading with just um, three people, but I think in general, I don't think it's ever done that way. It's usually you need a minion 
uh, which is 10 people. So what does that have to do with Braishi? What does that have to do with this whole video series is, is I'm just getting into like tip toe, like the, 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 the extreme tip of the iceberg. I mean, not even the tip of the iceberg, maybe just like one particle of the iceberg that, that like, I just want to admit out loud that like anything I'm saying, a lot of it is my, I mean, most of it, I mean, I do, I'm drawing from many, many, many sources. Some of them uh, not Dati, some of them not Jewish, some of them uh, from some of the history, some of the classes I've taken in, in, both in yeshivas and both in university. Uh, I even took a, a Bible as a literature course in, in, in university. And I even had it in, a, I had it in a science class. We, we discussed, we discussed a gray sheet because we we're talking about cosmology, which is the study of the beginning of the universe or how human beings understand the universe. So a lot of what I'm going to say or what I've, what I've said in these videos comes from multiple sources. I'm not like a yeshiva trained uh, person. I didn't grow up in the yeshiva system. Um, I have been in some yeshivas, multiple yeshivas uh, for extremely brief periods of time. Um, I do try to keep, you know, do my best to keep Shabbat and kosher and uh, I do believe in God. Uh, but, you know, all those, all those things putting aside, I'm also just a regular person. Uh, just wanted to try to understand the Bible. And my, my main approach here uh, is always like, what if you're reading the Bible for the first time? Like, imagine like you're reading the Bible, like you just pick it up and you just start reading it in whatever language that you find it in that you understand. Doesn't matter if it's in translation, because again, even in Hebrew, you're reading it in translation. If you're a native Israeli, a native Israeli can, of course, read the Bible with the Nikud, um, but they would still struggle uh, uh, great. They would kind of understand it, but it's not really in quote unquote modern Hebrew. I mean, the, the verbs and, the, and the, the words they would be familiar with. Most of them, there are some concepts in the Torah that are not in modern Hebrew or like consider, and they, when they read it, they'd be like, oh, this is poetic or high level Hebrew. Like they even know, like, like they understand that the, the Torah is written in an Hebrew that they don't speak it, that we don't use so frequently anymore. Although most 99.9% .9 of Israelis who, you know, grew up in Israel and even if they're completely and utterly non-religious and as long as, you know, they know their alphabet, they could in fact read the Torah. They could even learn the trope or the, the, the cantillation uh, relatively easy, uh, probably easier than somebody who's not from Israel. Um, but again, you always need somebody to guide you. Like you, you Rashi got, you know, not, I mean, it wasn't the first, like Uncleus and Uncleus lived in uh, like the first, what, second temple period, you know, and he, he is a convert to Judaism. Uncle is converted to Judaism and he, and he's uh, read and he wrote in Aramaic and he kind of you could consider that a translation. It is a translation, but also sort of a commentary. Uh, there, is there a difference between translating something and making comments? Uh, that's an interesting, uh, you know, concept in and of itself because it's translation is a form of a commentary because you're sort of you're you're inserting your uh, at some level your own opinion your own you know idea of what the sentence really means when you're giving it over even if you're giving it in the same language in Hebrew you're 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 like you're expounding the verses you're explaining the verses in a way that like makes sense to you and hopefully makes sense to other people and how you as a, as that translator or, or commentator understands it of course uh I, I be you know it's almost be forbidden for me not to mention that you know anybody who would you know anybody who's commentating on the torah who's considered let's say a, 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 a goon or uh you know from the mishnah talmudic or goonic or um rishonim time period anybody that's like we we that let's say dot studied in the dati torah mitzvah world any of those people they all they all believe that god existed they all believed that the Torah was um, given to Moses on Sinai. They all believe, almost every single one of them believe the exact same thing about, about Judaism, about Hashem, and about, you know, halachas. They might come up with different opinions, but the under, again, like they're coming from kind of like, let's say, a similar place and a similar like strain of thought. Like a lot of them are, a lot of times they were writing their commentary in response to the world around them, like what was going on, you know, in the rise of the Christian world uh, or in the rise, rise of the Arabic world. The, Arab, the you know the Muslim Arabic world, or just the fact that you know we lived in Galut for so long, and whether the the surrounding population you know would it come to us and you know confront us or try to understand us or whatever you know experiences we've had in exile. A lot of the commentaries are basically in response to that, to to the actual experience that these people were actually having, and they're trying to address also their 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 immediate community, their community of Jews who are coming to them with questions, and so they would write their commentary not just for themselves but often. Almost always, for, 
for, for their immediate community to help you know explain Judaism to other Jews, but also to answer to to their to the neighbors, to, to our neighbors, our non-Jewish neighbors that we found ourselves surrounded by. So now that we're living in Israel, like the almost the majority of Jews are in Israel, and you know, the majority of Jews are in it, like the, the state of Israel has like eight and a half, almost nine million Jews, and we're the majority of population in Israel. Perhaps it's time to like look at the Torah from, from a different perspective because we finally, and after thousands of years, we are in our own homeland and we're like, you know, people are able to come to Israel like on air, on air flights, you know, regularly, even during Corona, it was, you know, it was a little bit difficult. Flights still could manage to get in and now we're going to reopen again and, and people could come to Israel. And so, you know, it was a very different time period. Like even, even 60, even 70 years ago, you couldn't get into Israel you know, and there was a white papers and Jews couldn't get into Israel. So the fact that we have, you know, 70 years of relatively easy access to Israel and almost everything's been translated to a, a language that somebody speaks on a native language, the Torah has been translated probably to every major language uh, by this point. You know, it, it's, it's no longer like a closed, maybe it was never meant to be a closed book because we see later in the Torah, we see that Yeshua ben Nun wrote down, you know, uh, on stones, he wrote down the whole Torah, uh, you know, multiple languages, according to uh, the Talmud. And also, you know, there's the 70 nations and there was the first, I think the original first quote unquote translation of the Torah was into Greek, which was uh, called the, the uh, Septuagint, which was by 70 rabbis uh, or 72 rabbis who were forced to translate it uh, by the Greeks. Uh, and that was an extremely early a translation that was done under duress, but it was a translation that was done. Of course, as I mentioned, you have Onkelos, which is into Aramaic, which is an extremely ancient translation. So it's not something new that I'm doing. Um, and I, I'm saying all this because I'm about to get into day six, which, you know, I can maybe make 20 videos about. Honestly, I can make maybe more than I can make probably a thousand, as I just said, of maybe a thousand videos just on Bray Sheet and just on day six alone, you can make maybe a million videos. So I'm going to stop this one and I'm going to try and continue. I am going to try to keep the videos brief uh, as much as I can, but I do want to cover uh, what I think is happening in the verses and why I'm, you know, a little bit, of, you know, maybe get to a little bit, know a little bit about me through my, my comments. And, uh, but that's not really the point. The point is, is like, I really have this strong feeling that, you know, I want this, I want this Torah, I want the Torah, I believe the Torah is really meant for anybody, it doesn't, it's not controlled by the rabbis, not controlled by the scholars, it's, it's not controlled by anybody, it was given in a desert, and the re one of the many, many more portions say, of course the rabbis say that uh, the reason why I was given in the Torah was because it's open, it's open to anybody, Judaism, you know, anybody can learn about our religion, uh, anybody, you know, we're, 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 we're not, you know, we don't openly convert anybody, we don't seek converts, but anybody can learn about a religion, you know, it's right here. And it's now that the internet has half the world's population is almost half the world's population has access to the internet. It seems that almost anybody could really learn about our religion and about Judaism, about the Bible and come up with their own thoughts, their own feelings and their own, you know, personal understanding. What is really going on, you know, in Bray Sheet, uh, in my opinion, again, these are only based on my, 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 uh, my extremely limited view and opinions uh, and thoughts. So I'm gonna continue with day six and uh, yeah, see you soon.